Activista Rise Up is about people coming together to take actions on issues that matter, that make the society fairer, more just, and that allows people to achieve their highest potential. Today, we're gonna have a conversation on an issue that many of us don't think about too much, but it matters to a lot of folks in our community. And specifically, if you have a child with disabilities, this issue matters because uh, that community is part of, of our community. And because people with disability are members of our workforce, are members of our communities, and we ought to figure out what are the issues that they're facing and how we as leaders must support that movement. Today, to have this conversation, to learn more about uh, this issue and, and uh, the leaders in the Latino community who are advancing more understanding about the rights of people with disability and the opportunities that we must create for them. Um, I have a great leader, an amazing human being, Javier Robles. Javier, please join me in the front of this conversation. Gracias, Patricia. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be um, a part of Activita, Activistas Rise Up. So. Thank, Thank you. you, Javier, and you are, I mean, we'll get to know you a little bit more, but I wanted my audience to know that you are recently being elected as president of the Latino Action Network. So Thank congratulations. You. Um, I'm gonna tell them a little bit about your credentials because I think it's important for people to, um, to get to know you at the professional level and then understand a little bit about, about your commitment to these issues and to the work of Latinos. But you have a bachelor's degree in sociology, right? And, and focus on Puerto Rican studies from Rutgers mm -hmm. University. And you also have a JD mm -hmm. uh, from Seton Hall University. So you're, you are also, uh, you are, um, you're also a, an attorney. Uh, well, and I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, an attorney. <laughs> yeah, I'm a lawyer. You have to, for an attorney, you have to uh, do the certification. So I went right to work after law school. I didn't necessarily practice law or anything like that. Yeah. Well, it, well, Tell me a little bit about your path. You know, you you went to you know you, you you went to college. You have this amazing degree. You are being an active for so long. I remember meeting you for as uh, for a long time. So tell me a little bit about who is Javier. Oh, sure. Um, well, I was um, born in Elizabeth, so Elizabeth is my hometown, and um, my parents moved back to Puerto Rico when I was um, a baby. Then we moved back to. Uh, the United States, um, mainly lived in Newark and Elizabeth. And at that time, I did not have a disability. Um, so when we, uh, when I was going to Elizabeth High School, um, going into my sophomore year, um, I sustained a spinal cord injury. Um, and at that time, I was actually living in Newark, um, or, and I sustained my spinal cord injury in Branchbrook Park in Newark, if anyone knows where that is. Yeah. Um, close to the cathedral there, um, you know, and before that, basically, I was just like any other, you know, young Latino living in the city, um, you know, with, you know, four parents. Uh, my father worked in a factory for all of his life until um, he retired to Puerto Rico. And, you know, my mother was basically a homemaker and taking care of our family. So, you know, this background experience um living in newark and you know in in the summers like a lot of you know people might remember you know places like focus which is one of our 501c3s in the state you know would have like free lunch so we would you know me and my brothers and sisters would go and get free lunch and we'd be you know involved that way but you know we were also very much a part of um you know, a lot of the poverty that we still experience today, like places like, you know, where, where the other place I grew up, Dayton Street in Newark, where it doesn't really exist anymore, and Seth Boyd and where my cousins and other family members live, um, what, what, were, what were called the projects, right? So crime, yeah. high crime, high drug use, you know, a lot of poverty, and mainly composed of black and brown people. Um, you know, which actually a recent article just came out saying how this space that um, is currently there will now be turned into movie studios. Yeah. Um, 
you know, which is Lions Gate. Lions right, Gate area. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so at the age of 16, I did experience a spinal cord injury um, where I became a quadriplegic at the, what's called, it's called the C5 level. Um, yeah. And, you know, from there, basically, I went back to high school and I was fortunate to have um, a really cool, uh, amazing guidance counselor. And, you know, I, I know that, you know, sometimes we don't get lucky, but I, I was lucky at the time. And she was this little old Jewish lady, Mrs. Khan. I remember her name. And yeah. she was like, Javier, you know, you're going to have to um, bring your grades up, you know, because before that I wanted to go into the Air Force. And she's like, you know, you're not going to be able to do that obviously anymore. So maybe we can try to get you into Rutgers. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, that sounds really hard. I don't know if I could do that. And yeah. she really worked with me and, and worked in getting my grades up, you know, so that I could apply to the EOF program or EOP program yeah. at the university. And, you know, this is a, a, a really big deal for a lot of people. And it's um, a way for people to get their foot in the door at Rutgers, especially if, you know, you come from a disadvantaged background. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was able to, you know, get into that program for the summer and, you know, I really learned a lot and, you know, I made connections at that point that I still, you know, have today, but, you know, it was a way for, you know, someone to actually have an opportunity. So, you know, that's sort of. That's, that story speaks to me about how the importance of having um, counselors in the schools that care about whatever is happening to uh to young people at that point. And I can just imagine, um, you make it sound like, you know, you said I have, I had, I got a spinal injury and then, you know, I went back to high school, but that must have been traumatic for you. You know, that's it. You know, mm-hmm. How do you manage going from, you know, be, having, you know, what we all consider a normal um, childhood, uh, normal uh, teenage years, and then go through this traumatic experience. And then what, what sustained you during that process and what inspired you to, you know, um, to keep going in many ways? Yeah, and that's a good question, right? And it's something that I talk to people with disabilities today, like when I go and talk to newly injured people or, you know, talk to people for the first time that really are asking themselves that question, like, you know, how do you get past having a a serious injury and a, a lifelong disability you know, at the age of 16 or, you know, whatever age you're at at that point. And, you know, how do you just say, you know, I don't want to give up. I want to, I want to try and do new things, you know, and it's difficult and not everybody can do that. And it was difficult for me. Um, It's difficult for everybody I met at Kessler Rehab when we were in there. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's even harder today, right? When I went to rehab in 1983, you could spend four or five months in rehab. Today, if you have a spinal cord injury, you're in and out in four weeks max. Wow. Right. So you don't necessarily have a chance to even process what happened to you. You don't have a chance to speak to people. You don't even have a chance to speak to other people who've had the same injury, you know, like I did. Um, You know, and we think about the challenges that people face today in healthcare. You know, and this is a challenge across the board, whether you are having a baby as a mom, you know, you're in and out. They don't want you there. Or whether you are, you know, have a spinal cord injury. It's sort of like, you know, and and people of color and Latinos and African-Americans in particular, um, you know, are suffering at the hands of a healthcare system that really is detrimental to us. And, and back then I was fortunate that, you know, I had that opportunity when I think back on it, but it's wasn't easy. You know, I'm, I had parents who are strong parents who helped me, you know, my father had to go out and like, look for an accessible apartment, right? We lived in, in Newark in an inaccessible place. And he had to find a, an apartment and he had to like set it up and, you know, come and pick, you know, pick me up from the hospital and like learn how to do transfers from a wheelchair to a bed or, mm-hmm. you know, take care of a catheter, or all these other things that people don't think about. But You know, those, you know, and my sisters, you know, as well, you know, they're the, and and, you know, La La Familia in in our community really is the backbone of anything, any success that happens to us. You know, we always say, well, 
or, or people always believe that they're self-made, that they made it themselves. And, and we know in our community that that's not true, that without, you know, our moms, our dads, our extended family, we wouldn't be, you know, if we are successful, we wouldn't be half as successful without them. So, yeah. um, it, you know, no, no one gets, you know, no one gets to where they are by themselves, you know? Yeah, exactly. One of the things that I hear all the time from the uh, community with uh, people with disability and the families is that sometimes they, they feel very isolated, um, specifically when they just um, you know it's a new injury uh, and all of a sudden you have to figure out how to navigate the system and how to help somebody with the disability. So um, how do your parents survive that? I know it's part of the community, but how do they survive the the process of getting the services that you needed to the world rehab uh, and understanding the system that will support them as they supported you in your recovery. Um, and, and I'm just thinking of families who, whether you your child is born with a disability or you have a, a tragic incident like you had, you know, how do they go about understanding that process of that system that is around that is around for them? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Today, it's a lot easier than it was back then, right? We didn't have the internet. We didn't have Google. We didn't have laws which offered greater protection like the Americans with Disabilities Act, right? Um, which when my injury ha happened, we didn't have. Um, so for a parent today, it would be a lot, I'm not gonna say it's gonna be easier, but it would be a lot easier to get this kind of information. You know, for them, it was just like asking people in the community, asking the county, you know, speaking to people at the hospital. And those were the resources that were available to them and myself, you know, because I wanted to know as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we sort of made do with what we had, right? We didn't have Google. I couldn't go to a computer and punch something up and boom, there would go the information. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it is a struggle still today, especially for parents with um, children with disabilities, um, it's a struggle for them to find out, you know, can they get any benefits? Can they um, get any help, right? A, a lot of parents don't know, you know, if you have a child with a disability and you know what that disability is, you know, you can get assistance in New Jersey from the time they're born, right? You can get counseling, you can get assistance from for your child up to the age of three before they go into school. And then once they go into school, they could also get help through the IDEA, um, which is made for um, children with disabilities in school. Yeah. Um, sometimes we don't know our children have disabilities till later on, right? We can't tell. Like if you have Down syndrome, you can tell. If you have yeah. um, some other disability, you can tell, but not always. Yeah. Um, but I would encourage parents and, and people with disabilities to really use the resources in New Jersey and, and to hold our lawmakers accountable, to hold our departments accountable, the Department of Human Services, as, as an example in our state, um, is the largest provider of programs of any kind for disabilities, for the elderly um, in our state. And that's where you'll find most of your answers. They have an information line um, yeah. and, and they have most of the departments, including, including the Department of Mental Health and, and other departments. I know you mentioned that you were on rehab for uh, four months right after your injury. Uh, probably like five months, yeah. Five yeah. months. Um, and, and, and then I get you learned to, uh, to understand your own disability. Was there a moment that you just um, felt like giving up? And, and all the, I mean, all the time. I mean, when, when you're first injured, you know, like when I was first injured, I couldn't move anything at all. I basically... Um, uh, had this uh, halo thing. It's like this metal um, thing that they actually have screws that go into your skull and you're on this special bed and you're basically like, you know, you can't move and it's it's meant to stabilize your spinal cord. Yeah. Um, and, and then after that, you still can't move till you go through the rehab and go through like learning how to just move your arms just so you're able to like feed yourself or to brush your teeth or anything like that. Um, so, you know, obviously for a 16 year old who thought they had like the life of their, the rest of their life ahead of them, it's, it's sort of difficult to process that, you know, and, and I was fortunate again, you know, not everybody is fortunate as I yeah. was even today, you yeah. know, especially people who don't have health insurance 
um, or people who are immigrants to our country, right? People who might be here, um, you know, because they came to work and they came to make a better life for themselves. And all of a sudden they fall off a roof, right? You know, and, and I've heard of these stories or, yeah. you know, something happens to them, right? And all of a sudden, you know, they are really in a bad position to some extent. Yeah. So, you know, I, I always know that I personally am, am very fortunate. Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a human spirit and the, the story of your recovery and what you have done with your life, because you have an amazing life despite, uh, despite um, your injury and, and, and the, this, the face of your life. How do you, you have become an advocate for people with disabilities. What was that path like? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you say you, you applied to Rockers mm -hmm. and you were able to get in. How, what was your life like going to Rockers and then you passed to becoming an advocate with pe for people with disabilities? So I think my path started pretty early, you know, in Elizabeth, I, I sort of remember, um, you know, I would always get picked up by the bus and the bus would drop me from my house to um, the high school. And then one summer I was like, I really don't want to go on the bus. I just want to, you know, roll my wheelchair back home and just do that. So, you know, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. So I did. And, you know, the first thing I find is like, there's no curve cuts, right? I can't get from one sidewalk to the other because there's no curve cuts on the ends. Mm -hmm. So I have to like basically roll my wheelchair on the street and like, you know, risk getting killed by one of our, you know, Elizabeth drivers. <laughs> um, and, you know, I went to City Hall and I was like, you know, why don't we have curb cuts on, on these streets, you know? And, you know, the person was like, well, we should. And I was like, yeah, but we don't. And it sort of started there. And then when I got to um, Rutgers, you know, I was having some of the same issues, right? There was no curb cuts, there was no ramps to certain places. And I started a, a disability movement or a disability group called Rutgers Handicapable, which isn't too politically correct today, but <laughs> that, that was the name of it. Um, and, you know, we started with like five students when I first got there in my freshman year. And again, you know, I found a person there at Rutgers, you know, who was a staff, Linda McFarland, and she was like, oh, you want to start a group? And I was like, yeah, that would be really cool to do like a disability group. And she, you know, helped me with this stuff. Um, and, you know, basically, we again, we started with five students by, you know, the fourth or fifth year. You know, we were at like 60 or 70 students and we had a huge budget and we had already had already done like, you know, power doors in, in the student centers and we had done ramps and we had bought in people to do performances on disabilities. And a lot of the, the people who were members were also Latino and, you know, people to this day that I know. And a lot of them, you know, one of them became my wife, Amy, who I met, you know, at Rutgers and eventually became part of this, um, you know, student group, you know, and then, you know, just amazing people like, you know, Sandra Rocio Castro, who is this advocate yeah. in Puerto Rico was a member, um, you know, of our group. And, you know, one of the deans at Rutgers right now was, you know, a member of our group and, you know, really fortunate to have known these people. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to know that we sort of all started in this little group at Rutgers and, and yeah. have moved out, you know, and, and done our own things and have our own experiences with disabilities, you know, in, in one yeah. way or another. But have also been great advocates, so. Yeah, I have learned a little bit about um, um, you know the leaders that have be that began talking about the disabilities justice movement and how disabilities. I mean, it's not disabilities that you see, but also all types of disabilities. So, um, who are the leaders um, who inspire you and that you admire for pushing forward? an understanding of disabilities in our community, Latinos, but it, uh, and how it impacts us. Um, maybe you can share a little bit about, you know, who they are. I think we, we not consciously, we care about this issue, but we don't consciously uh, try to uh, engage. So I want the listeners to understand that there's actually a lot happening in this, in this movement. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot happening nationally and there's a lot happening in our state. Um, with, you know, a lot of great leaders, you know, Judy Human, who 
you know, a lot of people have heard a lot more about lately because, you know, um, she's been out there. She just wrote a book or two books actually has a children's book is a great example of a long-term advocate, you know, who started, you know, advocating for herself and her mom advocated for her in Brooklyn when she was just a young child because she wanted to go to, to grade school, elementary school. And they told her, you know, we can't let you in because your wheelchair would be a fire hazard. Right. And then they oh, wow. the school district and they won. And eventually she wanted to teach once she graduated college and they told her, you know, we, you know, we don't necessarily want, uh, you know, a teacher with a disability. And she sued the state, the state of New York and, and won. And, you know, since then, you know, has has also been one of the lead advocates for the 1973 Rehab Act. You know, was one of the big pushers. Um, so she's a great example of a long-term leader that has really made a difference. But you know, we also have leaders, you know, in our community that never get acknowledged. You know, Latino leaders, um, Black leaders, you know, who have disabilities or who are in other fields. You know, you rarely hear about them, and it's really important to like uplift them and and you know really bring them into the light because a lot of the work that they do is just as important, right? It's super important, whether it's at a local level or a state level, um, you know, at, at a national level, we have um, two great leaders. We have uh, Andres Gallegos, who's the uh, chair of the National Council on Disability, which is a huge group um, that does a lot of work in the disability field. They actually just put out a report on uh, Puerto Rico, and people with disabilities in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and how they get, um, you know, I would say third class um, citizenship. At this yes. point. Yeah. Once they move from the mainland to Puerto Rico, they can no longer get like SSI, which is a, a lifeline for a lot of a lot of Puerto Ricans. Um, you know, and the Supreme Court basically said that we're not entitled to um, SSI because we don't pay um, federal taxes, although we do pay federal uh, we do pay for the federal tax roll, um, mm -hmm. wages, um, you know, and actually Puerto Rico pays more in that type than do six other states, including the Mariana Islands, um, which does get SSI. So, you know, there's a lot of national issues and he, he actually worked on that. Andres worked on that and his group worked on that and they just released the report actually just yesterday. Yeah. Um, Vicenzo Piscopo is another uh you know, great leader. He's a uh, Venezuelan. They're both Venezuelan, actually. Um, and he's the new president of United Spinal, which is a um, disability advocacy group that works on, you know, changing laws and working on people with spinal cord injuries and spinal disease. Throughout the, the U.S., they have about 58,000 members. And as a disclaimer, I'm on their board, so. Yeah. Yeah. So if people, if somebody... Um, is you know a family suffering from um, finding out that their kid or um, has a disability or or uh, their kid has an accident and suffers a, a permanent disability? Where can they go? It, what organizations in New Jersey are actually advocating uh, for those communities here? And how can they be part of that that movement? I know that you were trying mm -hmm. to create an organization for Latinos mm -hmm. to be able to to um, to come together and advocate for those issues. So what, what are the organizations and how can people seek a community? Because mm -hmm. you're in that moment where you need is a community to help navigate at this, uh, you know, how maneuver all the resources or the lack of them, you know? So. Yeah, I think the first place to start is a, a great resource online and there's an actual um, hardcover book that you can also get. It's the New Jersey Resources, which is a, um, book that we started when I was the deputy director of the New Jersey Di Division of Disability um, and, you know, has been around for a long time. And it tells you all the different resources, the different nonprofits, the independent living centers that might be in your community. Um, and those, you know, it's basically really good in terms of, okay, I have this issue, where do I go? It gives you the websites, gives you the information that you need. Um, but, you know, lots of times word of mouth is really important. Like, you know, we find out that our child has, you know, a mental health issue, right? You know, talking to other parents that have gone through this is really important. 
uh, just like any other disability, yeah. um, because they at this point probably have the experience, know a lot of the resources that might not even be in a particular website or book, um, you know, and basically would be able to help that way. In terms of, you know, general advocacy, um, during COVID, uh, people with disabilities in the state of New Jersey, as an example, um, were left behind. You know, I was fortunate to be speaking to someone at the governor's office and asking, um, you know, what's the governor doing in terms of people with disabilities during COVID? You know, people were unable to, um, you know, get things like food because, you know, EBT cards that they were using wouldn't work, um, you know, in the in, at the stores because they weren't set up that way or or PPE or any of this. So we started this group, you know, myself and a bunch of other people a really cross-sectional group, you know, parents, people with disabilities, communities, and actually wrote a report um, that we released and were able to get lawmakers and um, the governor and other people to act on some of these issues. But a lot of these issues are still ongoing, you know, things like we want to see the Office of Emergency Management, as an example, fully funded um, to assist people in national um, emergencies and pandemics. And that includes people with disabilities, but it also includes people that do not speak um, the English language or have difficulty understanding it, which is part of our population. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the things that I really want to, you know, see, you know, in my time at, you know, as president of the Latino Action Network is to really talk about, you know, cross-sectionality of these issues, right? And, and you had mentioned it early, earlier, which is, you know, I, as a, as a Latino, um, have a disability, which is one cross-section. I'm a Latino, which is another cross-section. You know, I may be poor. I may have a mental health issue. I may have, you know, any of these things. Um, and we really need to address those issues at yeah. a statewide level and at a systemic level because yeah. they, they affect us more than we think. You know, the social determinants of health, which, you know, a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of, aware of are, you know, things that affect you, where you live, work, and play, right? And for Latinos, that's our communities, right? If we live in a specific community in New Jersey, and by the way, Latinos are the largest, um, you know, I don't like to use the word minority group, um, but in the state of New Jersey at this point, so our communities are not just getting larger, um, they're also getting more diverse in terms of who the Latinos are, but also what those cross-sectional issues are and you know they could be mental health issues they could be immigration issues um and and we need to have lawmakers and we need to have you know the system itself address these issues so that we can move forward yeah i mean you have you have been uh elected as the president of the latino action network the largest um civil rights organization for latinos in new jersey Uh, so um, this, I, I mean, uh, congratulations on that. I, I, I was very delighted that, that you stepped up and and uh, took on this leadership role because I do believe that that to be able to do cross uh, intersectionality of issues and identities um, is is crucial to how we're going to advance uh, a, 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 a diversity and inclusion agenda on our policies. Right, like when you think about what impacts Latinos. If you think about housing, we have to go a little bit deeper and say, well, housing, how does it impact for our people, uh, our, our community members who are, are dis- have a disability of some sort? Mm-hmm. If we talk about uh, workers' rights, like how do we think about workers' rights and workplace issues and how they impact uh, workers with disabilities? So, uh, so I think you're at the right leader at the right time because we got to be more, um, more inclusive of all the different uh, identities and, and issues in our community. You have had a very profe- very successful professional career and you have been part of the Latino Action Network for a long time. But how, um, as a leader of the Latino Action Network, what's your vision of how we grow the influence of, of this community, of our community in, in New Jersey? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, I, I have to, you know, thank uh, Chris Estevez and, and Frank Freire who were the two past presidents, you know, and have really um, set the groundwork for, 
you know, anything that I do or the group does forward. And of course, they're still involved and still, you know, part of what we're doing. Um, you know, things like the educational lawsuit, which Chris was um, immensely involved with, or the Mount Laurel stuff, which Frank um, was involved with, you know, are two issues with that when we talk about intersectionality are really key. You know, when we look at the issue of education really briefly, you know, we're talking about black and brown students in our state who are suffering because we do not really have a choice in where our young Latino and uh, black and brown students go. So, you know, that's probably one of the most intersectional issues that we, if we look at, can um, begin to think of, well, you know, let's take this and continue moving forward on, to, on these issues. I think my vision for the Latino Action Network, you know, is to really continue the work um, that Frank and Christian have done, but really also bring in, you know, ideas like, you know, who else is affected like we're affected. And I think that building power bases with other communities, you know, like we've been doing, but even including more communities, right, um, that are affected by poverty, by immigration, by healthcare issues like Latinos are. And saying, you know, this is not just a Latino issue. This is an issue that affects a lot of different communities in our state. And if we can get a lot of these um, groups and organizations to basically realize that we're all in this same boat together and that we are only weaker when we decide to just go out and swim on our own, that we as Latinos are gonna benefit from that, that our community is gonna benefit from that. Um, you know, and for too long, and you know, at least this is my experience, you know, we have a lot of infighting within our own communities, within our own Latino communities, you know, and that at the end of the day it doesn't help me, it doesn't help you, it doesn't help anybody in our community. If we're too busy, basically fighting for the crumbs that government throws at us or too busy, you know, wondering, you know, about these things that are not trivial, but in the big scope of things, you know, could be something that could wait, you know, and instead start saying, you know, how are we the same? How are we able to push past, you know, these systemic, um, and built-in political structures that really keep our community, you know, in the same place for a long, long time. Whether we're talking about labor um, or health or any other issue, you know, we really have to mobilize, you know, a lot better. And, and, and you know, I hope that we can do that, um, you know, and again, build on everything that our past leaders and our past steering committees have done. Yeah. You, I mean, you had had a very successful professional career leading a lot of important organizations and agencies around um, in your life. But if somebody were to ask you, what is the most, what is the thing that you are most proud of uh, in, that you have been able to accomplish? What would you tell them? Mm. Huh. I don't know. Um, well, I, I guess, you know, my, my son, my daughter, my family, I'm most proud of them, you know, and, and the work that they've been able to accomplish and, you know, going through um, stuff that they've gone through. Um, obviously, my wife, who has been there, you know, ever since Rutgers, like I said, and has yeah. been really, you know, the person that keeps me going without her, I'm sure that who knows if I'd be successful at all to some extent, because, you know, we often don't realize how these these networks, these safety networks that people with disabilities have, you know, how fragile they can be and how one instance of something could really throw those systems off. Yeah. Um, and this is something that's that I'll just talk about really briefly, and it's important to us, and it's another cross-sectional issue, and it, it really shows um, the importance of us understanding, you know, the way things work around us. So yeah. the, the issue of myself having a personal care assistant right mm -hmm. it seems to most people like you know well that's great you know you have a personal care assistant 
However, today, in, in today's climate, the reality is that most people with disabilities and the elderly in our state and nationally are having huge difficulties in just finding a person to be a personal care assistant. Yeah. That, that means that they're at risk of institutionalization, hospitalization, injuries, because they don't have people to come into their homes to help them, to get them out of bed, to yeah. get them ready for work, to help them get to work. Um, in our state, just as an example of the cross-sectionality, over 80% of the people that are personal care assistants are women of color. Yes. Right? So yes. without this group of people, imagine how many people could be institutionalized. Imagine how many people and how many um, individuals who are elderly in our communities would be unable to like meet their daily tasks or their daily needs. So, you know, these are real issues that we need to address. We need to, we need to say these women are not getting paid enough. They're not even getting paid technically a living wage in the state of New Jersey. Yeah. They're African American, they're Haitian, they're Latina women. Um, these are issues that matter to all these communities, but they're also issues that matter to people with disabilities, to the elderly. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you know, really important. Um, so things like this. No. And I know that land and uh, is supporting issues of um, rights for domestic workers. You know, uh, trying to create a system in which they have permanent rights for employment and permanent rights for benefits. Because if they take care of people, um, they also need to make sure that they are able to take care of themselves, right? And be yeah, so, yeah. so I know that land is already supporting the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights, and that's a good example of the intersectionalities. So what's next for you? What are your plans I, um, for the, you know, where, you know, besides leading land into, a, you know, a, 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 into and the new era of this work, right, um, following mm -hmm. on the footsteps of Chris and Frank, uh, what what are your plans? What are, what are you doing next in terms of your professional goals, uh, and, I mean, I want to acknowledge that you you said it right. Like um, people with disability can have normal lives if they have a network of people that support them. That's, that's your family, and those are the mm -hmm. that that the community and the government creates for you. So, uh, so you you know you are you have a normal life in terms of your professional mm -hmm. aspirations. So, what are your your aspirations next? Um. Well. I think just trying to survive the next few years are um, <laughs> hard enough. I, yeah. I mean, you know, obviously I would like to see, you know, the groups that I'm involved with, the New Jersey Disability Action Committee um, grow. Um, I would like to see the Latino Action Network um, group as well, you know, continue to grow, um, you know, and personally, you know, at work, I, I do a lot on, you know, both disability, but also um, sports, health and wellness issues for people with disabilities and, you know, also diversity at the university. Yeah, you, so, are, a, you are a faculty member of Brockers University now. Tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. So I'm a faculty member. I teach at um, the Department of Kinesiology and Health. I teach a number of classes, including um, disability movement, underserved populations, which um, used to be health and social justice. Mm -hmm. um, as well as a field experience class, but we're also trying to um, get a disability studies minor pass. We've been working on this for about three years, myself and our co-chair Jeffrey Friedman from Mason Gross. Um, you know, and I was, uh, well, I'm still on the academic master plan, which seeks um, to look at how Rutgers could be a better place for you know, all students and students of color, as well as um, faculty and staff of color. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things that I've been working at the university on. Um, it, it's amazing. I mean, like you, early on, you mentioned this um, activist who actually had to sue the state of New York to be a, um, you know, a teacher and be able to teach. So it's, I, I imagine for students who see you being so, um, you know, in front of the classroom, that's an inspiration for them as well to be able to see you uh, lead, be out there, you know, leading yeah. and being a role model for them. So I salute you for, for doing that. Well, um, I, 
I, I sort of want to, you know, one of the things that, you know, is, is dangerous to us, and I know a lot of people don't know this, so I'm just going to say it, um, you know, and it's, it's a community we have, it's a, the conversation we have in the disability community is, you know, the inspirational or superhero or that type of thing. Um, you know, while it, it's great for the media and it's great for papers, the problem with that is that, you know, it forces people with disabilities on the one hand to always have to be somebody's superhero or inspiration. So, you know, the first thing I tell my students is I'm not your inspiration. I'm not a superhero. You know, I'm a person with a disability who's a teacher, who's a professor here. And, you know, we talk about things like ableism and, and, and other types of discrimination that affect the disabled community and how what the media or the general uh, population thinks it's okay in terms of wording really to some extent is detrimental to both Latinos and people with disabilities because, you know, it what what we want at the end of the day is to have the same opportunities to be looked upon as equals to, you know, say, hey, you know, I, I want to have a job. I want to have a family. I want to, you know, be part of the community. But I don't want to be, you know, your hero. I don't want to be your inspiration. I want you to find your own reason for doing what you do. Um, you know, and it's like a longstanding thing. And I know it's a lot of people don't understand that, but it's 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 something that's to some extent important. I think. No, thank, yeah, thank you for sharing that because yeah. I think that when we create a an ideal or a pet or a put somebody in a pedestal, what a hero should be, then, um, you know, people have different stories in their lives. So if you're not like that, then am I a hero? And right. So, so yeah. figuring out what's your own reason for doing or for getting up in the morning and for trying again. I think that that's the important. important yeah. Thing. I, you know, I, I, yeah, yeah. It's difficult to, be in that space, um, you know, and, and, you know, one of the most difficult things, and, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of people could tell you this, because sometimes you're in two different worlds separately, like you're in a disability community, Latino community, you know, the teaching community. And sometimes you're in those worlds all together, because you're doing something that will affect all these communities together. And it's, it's difficult sometimes to. What would you, you know, want other Latino leaders to know about this issue of, of, of disabilities that um, that you think will, you know, what will you tell, what would you tell them? They say, well, what, do, what should I should know that I don't about um, this issue? Like, how do I support it? Yeah, yeah I, I would say, you know, especially to parents, right? Because this is super important for parents. Give your child every opportunity to be you know, involved in everything that they want to be. Give them options. You know, don't don't say, well, you know, your disability, you know, you can't do that. Or, you know, you can't play sports or, you know, you can't be involved in this group or that group, right? Figure out with them how to get them involved, right? You know, I, I work with the New Jersey Blind Athletes Association and, you know, the co-teacher in my class is the, the coach for that. And, you know, you wouldn't believe how many times parents, especially of young kids, are so scared to just let their kids go out there and, you know, do wheelchair racing or, you know, play track and field um, because they think they're going to get hurt, right? Um, yeah. As an example, and we all do that, right? We're parents. We don't want our kids to fall down. We don't want them to get hurt. But the reality is you want to treat your child with a disability, just like every other parent treats their child with a disability. And sometimes that means that they're going to get hurt. Sometimes that means that, you know, they're going to have a learning experience from something that happens to them. Yeah. And it's going to be painful to you as a parent to see that, but you have to step back and let them do that. Um, because that's what creates independence in any child. Yeah. Um, but, you know, people with disabilities, especially Latinos and African-Americans who are 90% more likely to be unemployed or to 
um, you know, drop out of school or anything like that. You know, and again, we're talking about disabilities generally, right? Not somebody yeah. in a wheelchair. We're talking about mental health issues. We're talking about, you know, amputations, you know. From autistic, autism, yeah. which is a autism, big deal. Yeah, autism, which is huge in New Jersey. Yeah. I'm um, in many communities. So, you know, I think the most important part is to let your child be a child, give them every opportunity you can, find out the resources that you need to make sure that they feel successful. And once they feel successful, they're going to want to be successful. Um, you know, and that's super important for our community. Yes. I, I thank you for that message because um, me, being a parent is hard at any age and with any type of child. But, um, you know, I, 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 want, I want families who have kids with a disability to feel that there is a community out there uh, for them to seek help and support. So who who they, should they call if they have a question or they, they lost? Should they, um, how can they stay connected to the work that you're doing or or, or in the different organizations that you are um, working sure. around these issues? Sure, if, if we have a Facebook group for the Latino Action Network, which I you know welcome people to join. Um, we also have Instagram now and you know we're on LinkedIn. Um, if you type in Latino Action Network, you should be able to access us and, you know, the information should come to me if, if you have a question or anything like that. Um, you know, if you want more information about the um, Disability Action Committee um, or anything like that, um, I'll include my email, um, which is disabled, this T-H-I-S-A-B-L-E-D at gmail.com. Yeah. And, you know, you can reach me that way as well. And, you know, any of those methods for um, the New Jersey Disability Action Committee. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'll also include some of the resources um, that Patricia can, can yeah. give to you all. And if you send, yes, we'll include all the resources and all the research and all the links that you have provided us at the end of the show so people can have a access accessible. Uh, and I just want to remind our, our listeners that the Latino Action Network is a, is, a, is a statewide coalition of organizations that service the Latino community. So um, through this disability committee, uh, uh, Javier, you can connect people to the resources, whatever they are in the state, right? Yeah. And I would encourage, um, you know, Latinos in our state who want to join the Latino Action Network, who want to come in and either volunteer or work with us. We're always looking for um, people to assist. We're always looking for young people because it's important to train um, our young Latinos for the future of advocacy, whatever that is. And you know, who knows what it'll be in 10 yeah. or 20 years. But yeah. one thing is sure, and that's that a lot of the problems that we are experiencing today are not going to disappear overnight. And we're gonna need strong advocates to work on these issues. So, you know, just don't let your age be a reason that you don't come out to these things. You know, everyone should come out to these things. Yeah, everyone should stay connected and involved. Uh, yeah. And the Latino Action Network is one of those organizations that uh, will find somebody who's doing something on the issue that you care about. So always, always reach out to us. And I said to us because I'm also a board of the Latino Action Network. So yep, absolutely. I'm very proud of the work that we do to advance the Latino agenda. So what would you, um, we're almost coming to the close here. So what would you like to um, to say, like what last words to, uh, you know, perhaps a young person who is managing uh, uh, or their own understanding of their disability, maybe from autism to mental health, uh, to uh, to a more um, to a, you know any type of disability. What would you tell them about um, you know words of wisdom? I would tell them never let anyone tell you you can't do something, or let them tell you no, that's not possible. Right? There's a lot of different ways to get things that you want done done, and you know individuals with disabilities really need to be their own best advocates. And I know that's difficult sometimes, but we really need to um, push for the things that we want to see happen in our lives as, as Latinos as well. So I would say the same thing. Yeah. Well, 
thank you, uh, hermano, for all you do for uh, the Latino community and for this this uh, the, the community with people with disabilities. We we are excited to have your leadership at the statewide level, the national level. And I would just encourage anyone who, who is facing any type of uh, disability to join our community, to join the community of, of activists and leaders like Javier, who are trying to figure out how to get the resources and the support that we all need for all of our members of our community to have productive, successful, and full lives. So join uh, our community, join any organization, take action, and stay connected to us here at Activista Rise Up, so you get connected to leaders who are at the forefront of uh, leading movements to empower people to be their best. Thank you, Javier, for, uh, for your words, for your leadership, for your inspiration, and let's all come together uh, and push forward policies that empower people with disability and that make sure that they are productive members and are um, have all the all they need to lead successful lives. This is Activista Rise Up, and I am Dr. Patricia Campos Medina. Thank you for listening.